they bring a plethora of experience that we will find invaluable for this discussion. So um, please welcome, please join me in welcoming the guys um, to this discussion. And please just to reiterate the point that uh, Steve mentioned was um, please do ask your questions and drop them in the chat uh, when we, once we get to the Q&A session. So I'll hand over to Tom. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll kick us off um, just by um, thinking a little bit about why we're here today and, and why we have um, DORA uh, on its way. Um, it's obviously no news that um, the topic of digitization and use of data in financial services um, is a very important one. Uh, the use of data has grown exponentially uh, and that in and of itself shouldn't necessarily be a, a concern or a problem. But if you combine that with the fact that uh, in, in today's financial services world, we're looking at a industry that has grown out of consolidation with pretty fragmented systems, um, a generation of management who did not grow up with iPhones, um, and uh, a pretty sophisticated uh, landscape out there of bad actors um, that are that are trying to either um, destabilize financial systems or, or simply uh, line their pockets uh, through various forms of attacks. Uh, you can kind of see the, the case, uh, the burning platform um, to do something in this space. Uh, so that's that's essentially the, the backdrop, no news here. You've got a few examples on, on the right in terms of um, you know, recent headlines in this area. And it's fair to say that so far um, the regulation around this space has been relatively fragmented. It's come piecemeal um, based on uh, sort of the topic of the year, right? I remember in 2015 it was all about outsourcing. Uh, since then we've added various other dimensions um, to this. But when you think about what it takes holistically to manage um, operational resilience, um, it really had to come together a little bit more. So that's essentially um, what DORA is trying to achieve. And if we um, flip to the next page, you can essentially see the um, the components that DORA is, is trying um, to push on the industry. Uh, the first one being, uh, and this is universal across all pieces of resilience related regulation that we've seen around the world, is the first one is senior engagement. So there's really an expectation that both executive and non-executive management uh, understand in a fair amount of detail both the the risk landscape and what is being done uh, to manage those risks in the institution. There is a consensus that in order to do that successfully, a notion of an end to end service or process view uh, is required. Um, this is relatively new to, to many parts of financial services, as opposed to, for example, manufacturing where you know you've always had this concept of a manufacturing line you've always had a concept of different production factors coming in at different times and so people naturally think of risk management that way um, but in in financial services we we haven't necessarily seen that approach over the years and so this is proving to be a bit of a headache for for a lot of institutions the third expectation is a step up in testing and crisis simulation now that comes in different shapes and forms. And uh, when you go through uh, the different pieces of resilience regulation, as, as we'll do in a minute across the world, you'll see that that is um, also calibrated at different levels, but that is a, a universal expectation here as well that we're seeing um, across the world. And in order to deliver all of those things, there is a recognition that institutions have to prioritize. So when we talk about things like understanding your business processes, there is no way um, that can apply to everything that happens in an organization. There is a cl clear recognition that there needs to be a prioritization in place. So what is really critical, in other words? Again, that already exists in silos, right? Uh, you do that when you do business continuity management in the technology space, you do that when you talk about critical assets. But how does all of this now come together and, and how do you prioritize? So those are the four themes that I think pretty universally are coming through, whether you're looking at UK regulation, US regulation and so on, um, that really underpin this, this regulatory thinking um, around uh, resilience. If we, if we move to the next page, um, 
just getting into Dora specifically and, and what it is. Um, first of all, it's important to note that this really focuses I'm not going to say narrowly, but relatively narrowly on uh, information technology related risks. Now, in practice, that includes and I'm using ORX taxonomy uh, terminology here that includes cyber, it includes IT, it includes third party, but it also includes uh, privacy. Um, so it's not resilience uh, in a very broad definition but it is related to the technology that institutions run uh, and what could happen to that. And of course, it's data. Uh, why? Uh, I outlined it, this a little bit in the introduction. Um, the, the key thing here is really that there, it, there is a, a plethora of different guidelines and regulations out there at the moment, and there's, there isn't really an overarching framework that pulls all of this together. And um, as we'll, we'll come to discuss, there is an expectation that through DORA, there'll be more alignment and, and harmonization of that regulatory landscape. Who does it apply to? That's actually quite broad. Um, so it's not just banks and insurers, um, but it's also a range of fintechs and other providers to the financial services industry. Um, however, there will be a principle of proportionality applied here. Uh, such that uh, not every fintech or cloud provider or, or whatever they may be are held to exactly the same standard. That process of calibration has yet to come, and that's part of translating this into national uh, legislation. What's the timing of this? Um, the intention is for it to be applicable in 2025, so there is not that much time left. Um, and that, pro that timeline is essentially driven by that process of translating uh, what is a, a European level directive into national legislation. That will take the form of technical standards. Uh, some of you may know some previous examples. They're called um, RTS, for example, right? And, and, and they basically go to the next level of detail in terms of how something should be done. Um, and those will be developed um, by the various regulatory bodies uh, in Europe. Um, and national authorities will then um, take the oversight of this. So that's that's a very brief introduction um, of DORA itself. We move to the next page and how all of this compares to what's happening in the rest of the world. Uh, the first thing I would note is that um, if you look across the major pieces of resilience related regulation, the scope does vary a little bit, so you cannot really make a one to one comparison. What we've done on this page is we've used DORA as a starting point and its five pillars that you're seeing on the left-hand side, which are governance, incident management, testing, third-party management, and information sharing. And we've used those to compare against major other bodies of regulation. And what you can see is that DORA sets a relatively high bar. So where we've colored in a cell in, in green, we think that broadly those other regulations are on par in terms of what they require. But there's quite a lot of gray on this page as well. Uh, which I think just indicates that the DORA is a relatively ambitious piece of, of legislation. Um, if, if, you, if I had to call out one or two areas where there, are, there is divergence, it would be around things like testing, um, where clearly there's um, less of a, a bar set by some of these other regulations. Now, how does all of this work with the other guidelines that you're all aware of, information security, uh, outsourcing, et cetera. So this is supposed to consolidate to some extent the EU requirements, not replace those existing guidelines. Um, some of the EBA guidelines are actually explicitly mentioned in DORA. And so the expectation is that there will be some updates to those guidelines in due course to make them work with DORA and take out any unintended duplication. Uh, so that's that's the, the direction of travel. Uh, obviously, we need to see how all of this plays out in detail, especially as, as DORA is translated to, to the level two requirements, the technical standards. Um, but that's how it's been framed by regulators. So it's not a replacement. It is complementary. It is supposed to consolidate and align a lot of requirements, and they will then go back and update some of the existing guidelines in due course. So that is how 
uh, that is how the process is going to run and, and also um, hopefully gives you a little bit of a sense of where this sits compared to what's been going on in other parts of the world. Uh, what I would now do is hand over to my colleague Mark, who's going to talk you through some of the specific requirements across the five pillars of, of DORA. Sorry, sophomore error did not unmute. Um, if we could go to the next page, uh, please. And Dean, I think you might want to help out here uh, as well. Um, I, this page sort of lays out in more detail the five pillars that Tom was uh, was referring to. And I think for the purposes of our subsequent discussion and Q&A, it's probably useful to go through this in a bit of detail. Um, so the five pillars uh, at the top, um, there's sort of an overarching area related to ICT risk management and governance. Um, the idea being that, um, you know, that uh, financial entities need to define, approve and oversee and be accountable for the policies, processes, protocols, um, uh, the implementation of, of uh, the ICT risk management framework. We'll come on and talk about that in a bit more detail because I think how you approach that um, is not laid out in any prescriptive detail in DORA. Um, but some of the other regulators have, um, you know, offered, uh, I, I think, a more systematic way of looking at ICT risk that that merits consideration. And then underneath um, the roof of the house, so to speak, the the, the risk management and government, we have we have four other pillars: um, incident reporting, uh, which relates to the need to establish uh, and implement uh, a an incident management process. Um, and one, you know, that complies with, you know, what I would see as, as sort of NIST type principles, thinking of the cybersecurity standards, um, you know, the, that incident reporting needs to be able to detect uh, in, a, in a holistic way um, the types of uh, risks that are tracking across the organization. Um, it needs to have uh, the wherewithal to manage um, those incidents when they occur, and um, importantly, to notify um, other people internally, but also externally, critical stakeholders like regulators, uh, when an incident uh, of sufficient materiality takes place. Um, the next uh, pillar three is around operational resilience testing. Um, you know, it says here that. Um, you know, again, these entities had need to conduct regular testing uh, of uh, the risk management framework tools and systems, and that that testing needs to be robust, um, including um, uh, not just a paper exercise, but, uh, you know, a robust test of network security, physical security, um, and, and other forms of testing that give assurance that um, that the uh, um, the capabilities that the organization has are, 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 are sufficient to manage the risk that, 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 that you're seeing. Um, the the f next pillar uh, around third party risk is probably the most detailed, I, I would say, and the most prescriptive in terms of, of expectations. Um, um, you know, the idea being that uh, organizations inherit um, ICT risk through uh, third party vendors. They need to be aware of what risk uh, there is and take steps to to mitigate that uh, as, as much as possible. Um, and um, the um, the regulation lays out again quite explicitly a set of the types of contractual provisions that it it, it would you know uh, would like to see in place, um, specific ways of managing concentration risk and so on and so forth. Um, in the in the work that we've done, this has been this has been an area that um, that we end up diving into in quite a lot of detail in order to see whether the procurement and sort of vendor management processes that exist are you know it, it, adhere to uh, to these standards. And, and then finally, uh, there is a uh, a pillar around information sharing, um, which talks about the need to exchange uh, cyber intelligence. Um, you know, between uh, uh, banks in a way that makes the entire ecosystem um, safer. 
And I think here um, the regulation, which has been talked about for a few years now, you know, is taking the lead from some of the stuff that we see uh, in places like the UK and Austria, uh, where uh, the banks have organized yeah, uh, collaboration okay, centers so um, and, um, you know, are have a formal. Uh, Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, have, uh, I was saying um, uh, things like the Financial Services uh, Cyber Collaboration Center in the UK have established uh, formal um, protocols uh, for exchanging cyber intelligence and also for coordinating cyber defense. Um, but uh, this this pillar, I think, is what the regulators had in mind. Uh, go ahead, Dean. If we look at the, the five pillars, some of the interesting parts of the regulation, and I think where there is emphasis that is different to what we see from current common practice, and, and specifically where we believe DORA is pushing against uh, a, a lot of, uh, or rubbing up against the actual architectures of our clients, specifically sits around, I think, the, the learn and evolve the specific wording in, in the regulation requiring organizations to have a, a specified process for how they learn, evolve and continually add to their controls based on incidents is uh, important. Inside of incident reporting, the timescales here are minimized to needing to report major incidents or needing to report incidents by the end of business day, which puts a lot more pressure in regards to automating your reporting and understanding the flow of dependencies through your technology and how that impacts specifically on the services that you provide is an important mapping that Dora is almost all of Dora is predicated upon being able to understand for each of the services that you provide you need to understand the systems that rely you rely on in order to do that and the third party providers so in any case being able to provide an initial response by the end of business day or no later than four hours after your next business day which is pretty uh pretty condensed from a timeline point of view uh means that putting more focus on automating and properly and thoroughly mapping those interplays is is incredibly important um the resilience testing also fits into that as well in regards to the requirements to test in collaboration with your third party suppliers not just in an independent way and to assume that all of your third party providers are going to offer you a perfect service um and then specifically in regards to third party risk, the other piece of very specific um, wording in the DORA regulation there is around the need not only to have good plans for exit management and good contractual uh, obligations in regards to your agreement, but also to actively test for the exit of your critical third party providers as well. So having a decent and tested plan to exit technology vendors is something that is not necessarily something that we would see uh, commonly done in in our experience. Mark, back to you. Good stuff. Um, if we go to the next page. Um, I guess as Tom said, you know, the um, Dora is um, a, a challenging um, set of, uh, it's a challenging regulation. And um, although it's still early days, you know, we're beginning to, I, I guess, see some of the challenges that um, financial institutions are incurring as they think about implementing this stuff. And and this page sort of lays lays these out. I won't go through everyone in detail, but just highlight a, a, you know, a few of them. Um, I mean, the first around, uh, you know, sort of the risk management and governance pillar. Um, I mean, one of the problems that we're seeing is a, a lack of agreement on the scope of, of ICT risk. You know, where should we apply our gold-plated uh, control environment? Where should we be looking for 
uh, you know, hard at uh, the risks that we're incurring day to day. Um, and, you know, that and I think the UK regulator is the one that 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 really, um, you know, was the first to highlight this. You know, it, it, it's really dependent upon your understanding of what your critical services are. And in order to implement the governance framework, you have to have agreement across the organization about what constitutes those those critical services. I'm going to come out on the next page and talk about that in a bit more detail, but that that's certainly something that we see uh, clients getting hung up on uh, as they start to think about, um, you know, the scope of this. Um, sorry, if, if you go back to the next, uh, if you go back to the previous page 12, please, I'll, I'll just clear clear this page. The other issue uh, with risk management and governance is um, different approaches for ICT risk management across different parts of the organization. Um, specifically, uh, you know, for the multinational banks, we see very fragmented um, approaches that are inconsistent. You know, often you have a large um, sort of mothership or domestic market that has fairly robust governance, but as you move to smaller and smaller jurisdictions, um, the government be the governance begins to break down a bit, and we see those organizations really wrestling with, um, you know, the, the I guess the spreading of a of a standardized uh, way of managing that that ICT risk. Um, on the incident reporting, um, you know, here again, I, I think we see um, problems related, certainly to the. Uh, you know, to the issue that um, that was just raised, uh, where um, you know we have inconsistent categorization of incidents across the organization and different types of severity thresholds in a way that makes it really hard to aggregate um, or, or create an aggregated view of 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 incident severity and to identify the ones that are the most severe and have the most you know potential to um, to disrupt the business. Um, there's also some, I guess, falling down on what I would call incident management 101, where we just have poor tracking of issues that are raised, uh, poor audit trail, a lot of manual work, which makes um, life difficult when it comes, you know, again, to aggregating and trying to synthesize the the incident picture in 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 the institution as a whole. Um, on the testing side. Um, you know, the I think the regulation is pretty clear that it's looking for um, institutions to put in place a, a regular testing uh, re regime that is risk based on, you know, the view of, of of where the most significant risks lie, where the most critical services lie and to test to test those. Um, again, that flies in the face with of a lot of the, I guess, the more ad hoc approach that we see a lot of. Um, your peers uh, taking to testing, uh, where it's conducted, um, um, you know, on a on a sort of as needed basis, without a lot of forethought, or a lot, certainly not a risk based uh, uh, approach. Um, on the third party risk, also, uh, I, I think, um, you know, here we're finding, um, you know, lack of, of of standard contractual arrangements and 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 pre contractual due diligence. Um, again, here, um, different standards across different parts of the organization, different jurisdictions is, is, is I think, proving difficult. Um, information sharing, um, a lot of this is jurisdiction dependent, you know, um, in um, certainly, um, you know, jurisdictions that have initiated the sort of uh, uh, information sharing the, that you have in the UK. I, I think this is much easier to comply with. It's much harder to do it um, kind of off your own back if you're a, a single institution um, in a in a in a country that doesn't yet have um, you know these sorts of these sorts of protocols set up. Um, I wanted to come back to the just the, the 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 governance point on the next page. And again, we can we can dig into this a bit more in the Q and A if you're interested. But. Um, uh, there's sort of a daisy chain of operational resilience that I think underlies DORA and a lot of the other, um, you know, regulatory frameworks that that Tom was talking about. 
Um, and we tried to lay it out on this on this page. And I, I guess this is sort of the mental map that we have when we begin to look at 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 resilience capabilities and 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 begin to ask ourselves whether or not they're complying with the spirit of Dora, although Dora doesn't lay it out and as explicitly as this does. Um, I, I guess it starts, you know, as we discussed on the left hand side with um, a, a clear view of what those critical business services are. And for each of the business services, um, having a good understanding of what that end to end uh, process looks like. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're sort of you're sort of dying in in in, in process maps here, you. Um, but you know at least um, have a view of uh, you know roughly how critical end to end processes are tracking through the organization, how data uh, and and output is 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 flowing through those, and then associated with each of those, you know what are the um, core ICT assets that we need to drive those processes. Uh, what are the crown jewel systems that that we need to drive the most important um, or critical business services? And for that sort of process and asset ecosystem, what are the operational risks that we're facing um, and how severe are they? What are the controls we have in place or that we need to have in place in order to mitigate those risks? Uh, those risks? And how well are those controls working? You know, are they operating within our um, our tolerance threshold. Um, and if uh, the worst does happen and that risk becomes acute, um, you know, are, do we have uh, credible and robust plans in place to recover from them? Uh, and then lastly, I think critically on the right hand side, do we have uh, a, uh, you know, transparency across all of the entire daisy chain? Do we have um, KPIs that are are tracking the risks and the control effectiveness in a way that gives us a at least a rough view of um, you know where uh, controls may not be working as well as we expected, and where we may be operating out of that out of that tolerance threshold. So when we talk about sort of the platonic ideal, the holy grail of of operational resilience, you know it involves this daisy chain working working well. And again, if you go back and read the Dora legislation with this this sort of daisy chain in mind, um, you can see uh, the regulator referencing a lot of the a, a lot of the elements here. We get to the last page and then we'll turn it over to to questions. Um, again, we, our, our view is that, you know, uh, we should start preparing for Dora um, and it starts with, I think, senior engagement. In fact, the lack of senior engagement and lack of senior understanding is one of the is is one of the key challenges that we're already uh, we're already starting to see. Um, understanding those critical business uh, uh, services and having uh, you know broad agreement throughout the organization on those is also critical. Uh, making sure uh, that um, you have a, a robust strategy for third party uh, risk management. Um, and that that is being uh, put in place if it isn't there already. Um, defining, you know, a set of, of, of early warning signs um, and, uh, you know, making sure that you've got uh, a, a tracking schematic uh, that, you know, we talked about on the right hand side of that previous daisy chain page. Um, trying to uplift uh, and take a hard look at your incident uh, uh, reporting and management and making sure that that's fit for purpose and then Finally, um, you know, looking at your testing framework uh, and um, um, again, ensuring that there's an, an, an overarching sort of risk and strategy led um, um, uh, underpinning of that of that testing framework. 